And I would like now to call Paul Pangaro to continue the uh, earlier introduction to cybernetics. Is that long live cybernetics? What's the relevance? What we imagine, plan, foresee in the future. So this is just a very short orientation for what we'll be doing at the end of each day. And obviously cybernetics is dead long live cybernetics. Thank you, King Charles III. Came up at the right moment when I was writing the session. But I'm quite serious about reflecting on how we're doing. Is there a reason why this didn't come up? Can someone knowledgeable with this configuration uh, Maybe you can get that to be up there. Thanks. So each day, you'll see on the count, uh, session calendar, that's a slightly different time each day. We're going to ask ourselves a few questions. Like, what does that alarm mean? No, <laughs> um, unfortunately, I need the prompt. I didn't write the prompt. So, I'd like you to think during each day, if there's a moment where you say, ooh, that's a contribution, that's something we can continue to use or expand upon or do better with, that's the alive part. And make a note and come to the session at the end of the day or go directly into your, you, you can make it come up here. Um, all right, I'll just read it. So, every day, what evidence did you see in the course of the day for cybernetics offering value to modern challenges? Wicked challenges, global challenges, small challenges. Great or small. Okay. And along with that, what concepts and conversations, models and methods that came along can we gather and offer in the future? Offer to those receptive, offer to each other, offer to other networks of cyberneticians and systems people. But that's sometimes one can find it on the net, one can hear, oh, isn't cybernetics dead? Uh, I want to respond to that. I don't want to be negative about it. I don't want to spread the capacity for people to quote me saying it's dead. Some <laughs> colleagues of mine are concerned about that. And of course they can quote just the first half of the session if they want. But do gather, similarly to the positives and the alive part, what did you see that implies a lack of impact or a need for revision? And these particular questions were specifically on the Miro board, which is now linked to every <coughs> session description that's in the program at the very top. It says, if you like, go straight into the session uh, program and then go to the Miro board and enter some notes and post notes, and there's this thing here. I wish I could show you this. But in that case, I can be brief. Are there any questions? I think we have a problem, which is this uh, cybernetics thing. I'm not sure we're winning. We're winning the game of keeping it alive. Ray, sorry, I didn't see you. Please. <coughs> we may only have one of these now. Uh, thanks, Paul. Ray Ison from, uh, well, the Open University and the International Federation for Systems Research. Uh, what you've just said, I want to connect to what Ben has just said, and I would argue that one of the great challenge we have is is the acts of what I call deframing de pathological metaphors that pervade our society. And so, to me, if you take, say, Ben's arguments, the question might be to engage with people with their contemporary metaphors and to uh, cons engage in a process of genealogical construction. Where, where did that metaphor come from? What are the alternative metaphors? What are the revealing and concealing features of those metaphors? And so how can we arrive at the pathologies of those metaphors and displace them? Thank you, Ray. If I understand you, you're saying that that's the, 
that's the part that we're fighting about, people thinking it's dead, and that's the wrong metaphor. I'm trying to make a connection to what I was saying. I appreciate your interest in where you want to go, but I, what's the relationship? Well, uh, sorry, I won't drift away so much. Cy cybernetics is not dead. Cybernetics is trapped in dysfunctional metaphors. Good. And so unless we break out of those dysfunctional metaphors and have ways to do that, we will never displace those dysfunctional metaphors. Beautiful. And what are the mechanisms of breaking out of dysfunctional metaphors? Language. language. Yeah. Well, um, I've had several PhD students do work on this, and I mean, one can organize uh, uh, workshops and other things where you have metaphorical analysis. So if you've got a group of people from organization X, you can start off your conversation with them by bringing out their last year's prospectus and saying uh, one of the implications of these metaphors that you're using. <coughs> Yeah, there are various modes of practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other comments? We have, have a few minutes. Good. One second. Um, uh, Elena Leonard from Toronto. Um, one really easy one that I used to do with students was to explain a little bit about Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety and then give them a broadsheet uh, newspaper from the previous day and say, okay, how many examples can you find of a news story that indicates a lack of obedience to Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety? And they never fail to come up with fewer than a dozen. Wow. That's a great idea. Thank you. I mean, I just have something simple to say. I mean, it cannot be dead because there are a lot of young people here. Cybernetics. I mean, just because if it were only my age and up, it would be dead. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there are a lot of young people here, and it's, that's a good sign. Oh, oh. I thank you, yeah, young people. <laughs> I, I don't believe it's dead. Okay, just, but, just to put this goes on the list of good things. There are it's, young people it's here. Yes, dead. by design, <laughs> by conscious design, by those who put the conference together, and by those who have been trying to build. Thank you, been trying to build the um, society. Please. Um, there was one other over here before you. Someone here? Um, who was it? Was it you? It wasn't you. No, it was me, but I'm just saying. Phil was behind you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking a bit, uh, Bill Seaman, I'm thinking a bit about the beauty of ambiguity and that there's a richness in cybernetics. And somebody told me the other day that I was very interested in, you know, Mallarmé and people like this. And nobody, you know, don't you live in the real world? And, and I was, I, you know, I value ambiguity in my life. And the richness of artworks is that you can come back to it over and over and over again, and they release more and more and more. You know, you look at Kavakuya of Mobiles that, that uh, past work, or for me, Marcel Duchamp with his large glass and the green box notes. So, so obviously I'm an artist, but um, anyway, the, I, I, I think there's a richness, especially what Ben was doing, was pointing out the richness of the ambiguity. So the question is, how do we make that, how do we define the value of the ambiguity and the richness of the ambiguity instead of making it feel like we're dead. Thank you. Jude. Jude Lombardi. Um, playing with language, Herbert Broom. Uh, one of the ways to play with language is to practice avoidance. <laughs> avoidance when I choose in the conversation not to say something with intention. Susan Parente. Also, Richards. So avoidance. How do we create the language? And I think that that's the problem that I'm hearing in regard to verbalizing cybernetics instead, which, Paul, if I'm not mistaken, you came to because so many people said that to you. Correct. <laughs> so, in order to avoid cybernetics is dead, my question would be, what do we say instead? Thank you. Good. Other other comments? We have a few minutes. Well, this is going dead. Can you pass that? <laughs> I'll, I'll be happy to take it around. May I go in a circular motion? <laughs> uh, 
I'm not sure the answer is necessarily cybernetics is dead, as if, and this is, I know I say this for the ASC, but cybernetics is homeless in some ways, and it always has been. I'm mean, thinking of people especially talking about, there's never been really institutional support, uh, a single institutional support, as there are for other fields, like biology, for instance. It's always sort of been off to the side. Um, so I think maybe one way of reframing that question is to say, well, no, it's not dead, it's just homeless. Or it's houseless, or how you want to say the right way of doing that. But I, I love that, right? I think it's a way of getting into the issue of what happened. And the, home, the fact that it's homeless, I agree with, and that's one of the reasons why perhaps it hasn't persisted. Other comments? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think in the introduction to one of Vina's two books, he talks about it as being marginal. And he means the margins between sciences, but I think it has this other resonance of, like, multiple resonances of marginality, and that and he's talking about those margins as being where the interesting or relevant ideas and work is, and I think that that I think re reclaiming that as a positive is a um, useful thing. Thank you. I'm thrilled that there's so much energy about this slightly controversial statement <laughs> that it is dead and long to live it. Did another young person, did you want to ask a question? Young person. <laughs> 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 you were looking at me before. <laughs> 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 young person. I saw his hand go up. Yeah, I'll take the microphone. Great. Give it to him. Maybe the younger person. Good for you, young person. Yeah, my name's Jeff. Kramer. Um, Jeff, Jeff Kramer, could you come out a little bit further so I can't see you, sure. or just here you can they see you. want to see what a young person looks like. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, 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 was, I was hiding in the corner because yeah. I, I, I've i never really engaged with cybernetics in a very serious way before. Well, come and do that now. By just oh, further. Oh, further. Oh, 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 okay. 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 Very nice to meet all of you. Jeff Kramer. Um, I haven't engaged in a serious way with cybernetics before at all. Um, until now. Until <laughs> the past few hours, frankly. Um, thank you. And, um, you know, I was introduced to it, you know, through a simple phrase, which was, the purpose of a system is what it does. And I had worked in education previously for a long time, um, seeing what outcomes from the system versus what the uh, people say is supposed to happen in the educational system, and that disconnect driving me a little crazy. Um, so, you know, as a very new person, um, it doesn't feel dead. Uh, you know, I was able to find this pretty easily with a quick Google search, but also that, um, you know, I'd love to hear more people, and I'm sure it will come in additional panels, talk about really. Um, really tangible ways uh, that these concepts can be used. And the only example that I'll use just really quickly, um, you're talking before about um, people coming to the discipline uh, from what they came before um, and kind of the baggage they come with, then you use the word resilience. Um, in the world of education, resilience means how to design buildings to ensure that children are protected from potential mass shooters or threats or things like that. So when you said that word, you know, that's how it struck me. Um, and, it, and it, through my, the beginning of the cybernetic brain that I'm trying to uh, develop myself, um, you know, makes me think about, you know, trying to solve complex and, you know, a wicked problem that I've, you know, been introduced to of, of something like that. So. You know, I would I would just love to hear more people talk about uh, those those wicked problems, even even if they're difficult to do. Wonderful. Let's pursue that. In the remaining minute, I hope you'll indulge me of a story in which Heinz von Forster changed things for me. I'm sure that's for many people in the room. I gave a talk, and afterwards he said, Paul! <laughs> Paul! And then he proceeded to correct me, because I had been using the word ontology. And he said, but Paul, you mean ontogenesis. <laughs> and then he said, Paul, 
is a type of decision you stand on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. I thought he was done, but he wasn't done. <laughs> he said, tell us what you see. <laughs> oh. <laughs>